Welcome back everyone to Let's Play Field of Glory Empires as Pontus. Episode number three. Let's take a look at the world as I want to do at the beginning of every episode just to see how everyone's developing. Uh, the Goths appear to be expanding. I don't know how many they start with and they might only, they might even only start with one province. One or two, so they're definitely taken two. And I think that these guys have taken the province. The Aquitaines start, I think, with only one. Everyone's expanding. Everyone's expanding nicely, so we're going to start populating the known world. Uh, the Ptolemy Empire looks like it has not done anything. Oh, maybe expanded one down here, but I'm not even sure about that. No, I think they were bordering Nubia already. The Seleucids have lost two, make it three territories at least. I don't remember if they exactly started with this configuration that we saw previously, with only these three territory and and uh, with Antigone. Unfortunately, we don't really want the Antigonids to win that war. I don't think they will, but um, we want to try to steal land from, well, we want to steal land from everyone around us. So we want everyone to go to war and just kill themselves, killing each other. <laughs> okay, so anyways, let's get to, I don't think anybody else, I don't really, I'm trying to keep track in my head how the Samartians are doing. They're still, I think the Scythians may have lost one territory. They st they have these two. I think they started with those two. Maybe they didn't. Oh, it's over here. It's so weird how the Samartians and Scythians are so intertwined. Um, and now we're friends with the Iberians. Not the Iberians that we think of, but the Iberia. So let's call them the Iberia. Uh, maybe we can just call them the... the Georgians. <laughs> Should we call them the Georgians? I don't know. Georgia might actually be more where the Colchis are. I, I don't know. I'm not very familiar with the um, geopolitical landscape right here. And I mean that geographically. The geographical political landscape in present day, the present day Caucasus and all this area. Anyway, uh, so what's our plan right now? We want to maintain these little things, these little cooperations. It should give us some kind of bonus with trade. I don't know exactly how that works. I believe there's something called trade acumen, which essentially means who gets the goods first and maybe also dictates the price, but I don't know about the price part, but I think it's at least dictates who will get the goods. So right now, if we look at our trade goods, we're importing wool, which is thankfully imported from, oh wait, it's, imp it's imported from Sigarius, which is Paphlagonia. Interesting, although we have wool. Our wool is... Wait, what? Trade comp, trade income of zero. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. Maybe people don't need this trade good. Why would we be importing it from outside when we could import it from inside? So maybe that's what trade acumen does. Maybe the Paphlagonians have great trade acumen and um, oh, wait, I think we didn't produce any. So maybe this is what it meant by that we're going through a rough period or whatever, and we didn't produce enough stuff. So maybe that's why we had to import it from somewhere else. Anyway, we had to import it from somewhere else. This basically just acts as a, a money barrier. I'm starting to see these little ones in parentheses. This is all stuff I'm, it's just becoming clear to me right now on camera. <laughs> so this minus number yeah, so that's to get one. It's minus four, minus four, that's the cost. Okay, so we imported the hemp. Now we have two new buildings. And wouldn't you guess it? Oh, okay, so we're gonna build a hemp field here. That's perfect, so that'll solve that problem. It'll give us three tier one build, um, foods, food buildings, so we can get uh, tier two food buildings. We'll keep cycling in other options until we get a good option there, because, you know, something like public works, eventually we really just have to do it. It's just too helpful to keep passing up. Uh, okay, so we're building our blacksmith over here, which should only have positive, uh, should only have a positive effect on us, and that's good. Uh, decadence here is actually, I don't know why it's rising so quickly. Well, we'll try to combat it with culture. I don't know. At least we have uh, Calibia's back as a normal not famine not you know under pacification still lasts for another four turns 
Okay, so previously it was something else that was not under pacification. It was much worse. And now it's a little bit better, but not perfect yet. So we still have a little bit of ways to go before we can get back into where we really want to be. But uh, that's, it's everything's moving. As I always say, it's just moving in a positive direction. So we don't have a stud yet, and it's, I want to get all the different trade goods. However, and I already rest my cursor on it, the big winner here is stone. So going back to those trade details, you can see missing bonus, we would get five inf extra infrastructure from our brickwork if we had stone. Stone's usually just very useful in general. Um, the health penalty is not good. Let's be very clear about that. So I really like the herbalist as, um, as a health building because it gives us one extra manpower. Manpower is very tight for most of the Greek nations, the Hellenic people. Uh, we happen to be doing completely okay with it because we haven't done a whole lot of military expansion. So it's not a big priority for us right now. The health will be because now we're gonna have a negative health modifier from Clay Pit. So stud is something good. Herbalist is something good. Weapons Depot is, I would say, mediocre at best. I don't find it a very good one. Market is good for money, but we don't actually have leather or dye or cloth. We do have five extra money coming in because of having salt. So I'm really glad we chose salt at some point. Street parlor is also a really good one. And we actually have, um, oh, we don't have papyrus. So we don't get the three extra money or five extra culture. Okay, that's fine. I thought we did have, papyrus is somewhere nearby, but I guess we didn't qualify. Maybe again, this trade acumen thing. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead with a very expensive, as in very long amount of time it's gonna take us to get the clay pit. But I just think it's gonna be a very good complement to the brickworks we already have. It provides stone, which is useful in so many different ways anyway. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now we're still building our blacksmith over here. As I said, that's a really good one. Now over here, we have an even tougher decision. We have clear water, which builds in one turn. Public works, which is always something good to get. Um, I'm not gonna worry about mercenary recruitment centers. They cost a lot of money. So I'd rather just have my own people, which cost manpower. Now mercenaries are good for the Greek people because they have manpower issues, but it's not something that we have an issue with yet. Uh, Potter's Workshop is a really good one. Um, it's gonna provide, it's gonna produce pottery. We have a lot of good options here, essentially. I don't think we need to worry about tavern because money is not an issue at all yet. Uh, so if we go back here, this provides pottery. We don't have any bonuses from pottery, I believe. Let's kind of scan around and see what kind of thing. Oh, nope, ceramics, marble, luxury and stone, nothing here and nothing here. So yeah, we're not missing too much. We may want pottery later, but as it's not something we need right now and there's Flax is a good option. Look at no other, um, there's no other region building or, uh, that's producing flax right now. We can import it, but we're gonna get hemp here. So it just kind of makes sense to have everyone building a little bit of different things. So we're all self-supporting. Uh, it's just so hard to get beyond this clear water. But the problem is if we don't, if we turn down flax right now, now putting a ranch would be really nice for getting cattle. We don't have anyone producing cattle right now. And we do want cattle to supply our smokehouses, which are really good for in terms of both food and in terms of health. They are a health building, a blue health building. So what does all this mean in the end? It means I got to make some decisions. Okay, look at I really like the idea of putting a flax field here. But I think that a one turn clear water is just so hard to pass up. It's gonna give us a reset on everything else and there was actually a lot of good options here, which is a little bit unfortunate. But we'll see, I, I obviously we would definitely wanna increase infrastructure eventually, but I mean a one turn clear water, how do you turn that down? It's really hard. <laughs> so now our buildings are all selected, 22 turns now that we have something building in Amnius essentially not having a building under construction there, sped up the construction of these other two, and now we have something under construction there, so let's slow down these other two. Makes sense. Okay, so that's
pretty much all we want to do for this turn because of the pacification stuff going on and over here we'll leave the army in the far east and you know if we were to gather a fleet of I wonder how many are here we don't have access to the we don't have the fog of war removed I thought Anchorage did that no it doesn't okay well that's fine so it's another tier one building probably the harbor so we want to get a harbor there to remove the fog of war what I'd like to see is how many ships they have so if we build a, a, um, some ships some pirate ships in particular we can uh, uh their maintenance is pretty high but we can start raiding our neighbors especially I want to start raiding Paphlagonia because eventually in theory I want to I want to occupy their territory permanently. For now, I'll just end the turn. We're getting cooperation requests, which is really nice. We're starting to build up some diplomatic stability. Ooh, the Seleucids have expanded in the bottom. So now, that's two territories even. Very impressive. So they're fighting back, and we're still just barely hanging out above the limit we're still a glorious monarchy though so they can't take that away from us and what's even better is we moved up four steps again okay sharing information very good i don't really know why we did that it wasn't like a huge deal so our relationship is one with them but slowly i guess cooperation will build up that um i didn't actually explore the decision last turn well that's okay we can go explore it this turn it's something which we can't use emergency levy not something we're going to use either so, uh, this gives us 10 military units. Where is it saying? Veterans are called citizens are armed. Allies are mustered. Excuse me? Oh, here it is. Yeah, we will receive in our capital a total of 10 units, but we will lose some legacy points. 100 legacy points, 100 victory points. Look, I don't know what the legacy points are used for, for calculations of anything besides the final victory score. I'm still a little bit reluctant to use it. And I'm not even sure you can use it unless you have, I'm not sure you can go negative. The other one that we, so do we have to have, yeah, legacy must be at least equal to 75. So it allows you to go partially negative, not as much as we, as we are. This is the other decision which came up last time. It was this justice system. We can actually give amnesty, which will lessen the unrest of different um, places. The thing is, we don't have any places under unrest. We have this pacification, but it's really minor. It's under control. I'd rather save that decision. The negatives, I mean, there's always, it's a, you know, it's always a balancing system, right? So there's some negatives. If we do amnesty, um, we can gain two decadent points. Uh, that's decadence points in the actual individual provinces, not two aging tokens. But those decadence points could drop us into the aging tier, in which case we might acquire decadent i mean uh, aging tokens so it's probably worth it not to do that the only one which i think is kind of okay is this one justice as far as possible each region in unrest has a 20 percent chance per government building to revert to a quieter state so this is essentially just a uh, an, a riskless but low reward possibility um if you have a lot of government buildings it's very helpful but we really don't the only place we have government buildings is in our capital and that is Obviously not in any kind of state of unrest. So we just, I guess we just keep pushing on. Oh, wait, we finished clear water. Right, of course. So this is exciting. What new options will we have? And our health, the health of the ruler is degraded to average. The faster he dies, the better. I mean, the only reason I don't want him to die, mostly I do, but the only reason I might not want him to die is because whoever comes next might be worse. Oh, wow, a ranch which produces cattle. Well, what do you know? It was one of the things I was hoping for. Um, we don't have... We get a bonus of five infrastructure from lumber. I love lumber camps or timber camps. I don't know what they're called, but the one of them pr which provides lumber, it's a, it's a great uh, infrastructure building. I mean, it doesn't do a lot of infrastructure. It's like three infrastructure, but it gives you a little bit of money and it provi provides you with lumber, which happens to be a very valuable trade good I've found. Armor is going to give us a lot of equipment, which is really nice, but unfortunately, we aren't really building armies routinely, so we won't get a lot of, won't get a lot out of that. Candle shop, we really need tin to make this worthwhile. We'd have to import the wax. It'd be, looks like a net negative in, any, in every way. 
not a good option. And I don't like gambling rings because, yeah, decadence increase. So they've made our decision pretty, <laughs> pretty clear. There's nothing we can choose here. I mean, I guess you could choose Wheelmaker, but the ranch is going to give us everything we want and more. Not and more. Hopefully more than we want, but what I want right now is cattle and better and more food for this. Um, Emnius, and I'm not sure. You know, food's actually looking pretty good here. I might want to move another slave down so that we can speed up infrastructure. So this is plus five, and it would be minus five to take her uh, another citizen out. We don't need the money, but the culture might be nice. I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna think about it. We still have no food buildings in the capital. Well, the clay pit is a high priority, so we'll have to make do without for a while. Um, by the way, it's kind of uh, so our decadence per turn is three is 0.35 with the end you lose 10 percent of your total accumulated decadence at the uh i think at the after this is added which means that our resting point should be 0.3 uh, 3.5 so we're gonna eventually rest at 3.5 now down here it was higher right 0.7 i don't know why i don't know what's impacting this number unfortunately Structures, nation size, passage of time, regions that are newly conquered will also gain some extra decadence, unless if an objective. So if your nation is not cultured enough compared to its decadence, then it is dangerous. So, okay. So the, I'm just curious why decadence per turn is nation size 0. 0.7. Does the province, does being in a province reduce decadence? Probably. Let's go to the provincial over, overview, overlay. Political. It's kind of interesting. Uh, what is this showing us? Color coded according to the diplomatic status you have with the owner. Okay, so pretty much everything's going to be the same. Uh, provinces. This is what I wanted. So Pontus, we now control. Let's work right there. So we have those. Anatolia should be our next target. And. It's all the Antigonids right now. We need to have, I think, at least half of them to form the province. It might be more than half, a majority. So we'll have to go to war with the Antigonids. Now, it's the moment we see the Seleucids start. By the way, Seleucids, what are your thoughts on us? What would you think about cooperation? Based, so a chance of 12%. What we could do is offer a gift to them. By the way, this would also increase their chances of winning because <laughs> we're giving them money. If we offer them a gift, it will probably bring our relationship up a little bit. And right now, relationship is modifying at 0%. The fact that we are not neighbors is giving us a minus 10%, but that basically is canceled out by the fact that we're a glorious nation. I guess there's a base acceptance chance of 12%. I'm not sure how to play this. This is a, kind of a tough one. I'd like to be... I'd like to cooperate with the Seleucids. I'd also like for them not to take the provinces which I want to take. I mean the province, I guess, the, the regions in the province I want. I'm gonna just, you know, I'm just gonna sit on a fence and defer any decision on that for another turn. So that's what we'll do, I guess. Uh, this unrest of eight is just crazy. I'd really like that to go down, but I think it will in three more turns, so. Let's wait it out. Oh, that's right. I was kind of min-maxing the food and culture and infrastructure and all that, but... Ooh, the Iberiae have been gobbled up partially by Colchis, but I think Alani have gobbled up one of the Colchis places. So we got this huge war going on to the northeast of us, which we're actually not that much interested in because they are not Hellenic people. They're inferior. They're just Caucasians. Don't like how I seen that aging token, but as a glorious monarchy, all we need to do is prevent ourselves from getting five aging tokens. Uh, tokens don't mean anything for us in any other way. Citizenship status and state reforms. This is good. Convert ethnicities and reduce decadence. That is, how much do we have to pay? 
Grant citizenship to foreigners, minor. The wealthier foreigners can now acquire citizenship under certain conditions in your capital region and all regions of the capital province. A non-major, a non-main ethnicity citizen can become of your ethnicity 10% chance per government and commerce building tier in each region. I guess what that means is a tier two building adds a 20% chance and a tier three would add a 30% chance. So in theory, enough government and commerce buildings, you could have a 100% chance. Uh, otherwise we can grant citizenship to foreigners major and this allows us I mean, this will cause some un um, some disloyalty. Each non-main ethnicity citizen in your nation can become one of your main ethnicity with a 25% chance. Each region with at least one such conversion gets minus 10 loyalty and minus 20% manpower for 20 turns. That's quite a long time. I, I of course I need to see what the what's the demographics of our of our empire of our monarchy, I should say. This one is a series of forms and laws touching the rights and duties of citizens. Uh, so the government intends to gain efficiency and stability from this decision. Government age is reduced by one third, reduces decadence. That's amazing. The changes can disturb and upset part of the civil society and troubles might ensue. There's a 50% chance to lose a progress token unless your ruler is a good administrator or better. Our ruler is a bad administrator. <laughs> Actually, he's just, what is it? Temper like. I forget, the, it's minus 10% infrastructure. Like, blunt or clumsy, something like that. Reform the state and government. A vast reform by a leading noble or senator, perhaps the head of state himself, is initiated. The changes touch on ma many layers of society, and many citizens see their daily lives altered because of that. Depending on the administrative ability, acumen of the administrator, from abysmal to superior... Progress tokens or decadence can be gained or removed. In addition to that, each region will gain either a negative or positive modifier on commerce and culture as many citizens live, lives are impacted by the changes. So the, this one obviously is not good for us. We don't have a good ruler to present it. The best one for us would be reform citizens' rights. However, I think that we will hold off on it for a little bit. Maybe our ruler will die soon. That would be wonderful. And we have... 12 turns for this, so no rush. No need to rush it. Supported by the local priests, some people are forming trouble in Calibia. Well, that's not great. So a huge, <laughs> huge loyalty penalty. The commerce penalty of 10% just almost doesn't matter considering we're so negative in commerce. It's, at, it's from 50 to 60, you know, it's just pennies on the dollar. We're already losing so much money there. And new population in Phrenicia. That's great. They're building even more food and stuff. So let's put that new population to work. I could do culture. I might do culture. I want the hemp field. I guess the hemp field increases. Po Wait. Yeah, it does double that, which makes sense since there's no infrastructure. So all the infrastructure has to come from our citizens. Okay. Well, I'm okay with this. We still grow in seven turns. We don't add to our culture, but we don't lose any additional culture either. Doing okay here. We're going to grow nine more turns. We're growing in seven turns. If I move you somewhere else, what? Oh, we have no growth. That's not necessarily good. Let's leave one person there. We're still barely <laughs> breaking even here because of these stupid slaves. Ah, whatever. Just too much unrest. And this will be gone in two more turns, and that should help, though. Loyalty penalty of 20 is not helping us. So I think that's all we want to do, right? Eight turns, 17, 9. Okay, very good. Turn the sound down even more, but it might not even be audible at this point. <laughs> it's audible to me because my speakers are playing, but... Yeah, good. So we we are, I I think we're fine in this middle area, frankly. It's not, it doesn't hurt us. The only thing that we would do by moving up to the progress tier is one, give us some well, two things, I guess, yeah. 
one give us some buffer tokens so if we got progress tokens even if we go up to five progress tokens there's no there's only three tiers highest tier middle tier lowest tier we're at the highest tier glorious so what will happen if we go down uh what happens if we tr keep getting progress tokens we just cap at five and that's that acts as a reservoir so you know buffer tokens that we can lose later um that's the other benefit is that we knock somebody else out from getting progress tokens but it could be somebody who's over here we just don't care about it all so i don't really think of that as that important of a that's not a good reason to make the decision so i don't think we're going to change anything here yeah the only thing we could consider doing as i already mentioned is just What happens if we move you here? Yeah, it takes way too long. Whoops. Yeah, so we'll leave that the original distribution. Um, it's funny that our capital is going to be the second, only the second largest place. <laughs> this one's going to grow in nine turns. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, this one's even going to grow before the other one. Let me move you down here temporarily. What do you do? Oh, minus two plus four. That's a huge benefit. So the food is just, oh, uh, but we need the food. Okay. So now we're still growing in nine turns, but we have more infrastructure. I don't really understand how that all worked out, but it seems to be a net positive. So we'll do it. Okay, very good. So a little manipulation here and there. Seems, seems to be working out very well. We're even going to grow here, so I wonder if we can put this as minus 5 plus 5. So what if we do this, which means two turns, but we drop that down to here, and it's three turns. Let's do this. I'm just a little bit nervous. I would like to get progress tokens rather than negative ones. Could go to war with the Colchis. I mean, that would probably drop us down. Expanding is bad, especially if you're us playing as the, what is it, the Elenair Sotus. The one that's going to make it so we gain a lot more decadence if we attack non-Hellenic people. Okay, probably was the right idea because we didn't move up very much and we did shift our culture a bit, so we might have been at the verge of dropping. So I think that was a pretty nice safe move. Yeah, so Athens last time was glorious and five tokens because <laughs> it's funny. Glorious. Osaba's really kicking butt. So is Rhodus. Yeah, and Samnium's really kicking butt, too. Tarentum's doing well. Interesting. Slave status and freedmen laws. This is good. I think we're going to free people. Augment productivity or reduce unrest from slaves. Free some slaves. Let's look at this one in detail. I, I haven't read this one for a while, but I, I know this is very important because we have all these slave things going on. Slave status varied a lot between nations, but the common factor was being a living merchandise. In some nations, it was possible through the generosity of the master or a show of great skills to be freed and climb the social ladder. Very few nations allowed slaves to have children, and slave revolts were common and met with extreme violence by the army. We can first improve slave rights. A series of laws will improve slave rights. In regions with a governmental or science building, slaves can have their base unrest permanently reduced by one 25% chance per slave. That's not very good. Uh, regions with slave markets will suffer a penalty of 5 to loyalty and commerce for 20 turns. We don't have any slave markets, so that's good. Courthouses or palace are government buildings. Okay. Or palaces, I guess. School or academy are examples of science buildings. So we have a couple of those in regions. So these are called regions. It's official. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't read that earlier. And again, this is episode three. I still haven't released episode one or two yet. So a series of uh, reduced slave rights. We don't want to do that. A series of laws will slightly degrade, well, slightly degrade slightly slave rights. Whoops, a little redundancy. All slaves in your nation will, do, will get a permanent increase of one to their base unrest. Each region with at least one slave will get a plus 10% food inf infrastructure bonus for 12 turns. Otherwise, we have freedmen laws. Slaves can now be freed under certain cer conditions tied to the duration of their work or the generosity of their master. If a region has a governmental building, like a courthouse or palace, it has a 50% chance of returning to a quieter state if in unrest, or a 50% chance of converting a single slave 
to a citizen if not. Regions with a slave market lose 10 loyalty. Other regions gain 5 loyalty. Wow, that's nice. I like that one. That's the one I've done before, too, I remember. Incite foreign slaves to revolt. <laughs> Each region with slaves bordering your nation has a 35% chance of being in unrest or in revolt if already in unrest. You'll spend some gold per slave, whatever the results. So I think for us, the best option here is going to be either improved slave rights. Uh, no, probably just freedmen laws. So the region must have a governmental building like... Uh, that's going to be a problem. I don't think we have... Okay, gather food, produce more food or instantly gain. That's a good one. Let's look at that one in a second. But first, let me focus on the slave one. So we have a king's palace, governor's palace. And those are the only government buildings we have. So this might be lost on us until we get a little bit further into the game. Let's look at the gather food one. We can either... Uh, increase the output of our food, re our region's food by 15%, losing 10 loyalty. And this will cost a little bit of money. I do like that option. Or we can requisition food for the army. Um, we don't, so we have to have one military unit per four population to be able to do this, which means what we'd have to do is spread our military out to all four different regions. For six turns, loyalty will be lowered by five points in my entire nation and no population growth will occur whatever your stockpiles and food so the interesting thing is though you can uh, it just depends on what you want to do if you want to choose this one it'll cost a little bit of money and you will gain 15 percent um extra food output losing loyalty we'll also lose loyalty here but uh the benefit of this is that or the way you take advantage of it is by putting a lot of people to work in the food market so we'd we probably slow down our construction, um, which means we probably want to do it after we finish this one food building. I wish there was a way to actually prioritize different places in uh, within a, a province. Like it'd be nice if we could say, hey, prioritize this one and send more people to work on the ranch, less people on the blacksmith and clay pit. I don't know if that's possible. At least, I, I mean, I don't know how to do it if it is. Also, we have this hemp. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wait at least two turns before we do anything. And yeah, okay. So we have some good options available to, available to us. I won't make a decision on those yet. Let's keep advancing. So let's try to get to the turn 20 by the end of this video, which means that I'm averaging about seven turns. That's good. So there's 500 turns available in this nation. I mean, in this game, you can go from 310 to 190, I think. But we are unlikely to take a series all the way there. If we get even to like 200, oh, that's only 95 turns. That's not too bad. We can probably get to 200, maybe even 100 BC. That'd be awesome, but we'll see. Ah, weather. Okay, so I don't know enough about weather. That hasn't been explained to me. I need to read the manual, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, in the turn, right? Yeah, looks like it. So we have some decisions. Let me just make sure none of them are expiring. Eight, three, 10, 12, 12, okay, good. Ah, the Antigonids are fighting back. I mean, I just like to see them battling with each other. That's the important thing. I should click on the Antigonids and make sure that they're at war with the Paphlagonians. And if they are, it might be possible for me. Hey, we're moving up. Um, it might be possible for me to sneak in a war against the Paphlagonians. If nothing else, I probably should buy those pirate ships, as I said I might. Oh, Corn Law. Wow, food and water for the population. It's also... Lots of decisions are rolling in after having... I would say the longest stretch of no decisions I've ever had in this game. Let's take a look. Eventually these will be recycled and we won't have to read through all of them, but since they're new, let's just read through them. So I make sure I remember what they are. And then in the future, I won't read through them again. I'll just summarize them. If I don't remember, I'll just look at it off camera. So corn law and health regulations like the Gaius Gracchus law often had the purpose of quieting the populace or favoring a prominent political figure. Yeah, that's true. I remember the guys cracker stuff going on just uh, prior to Caesar, I guess, ascending. Was it or was it the time at the end of Caesar's reign when there was infighting? Uh, maybe this was the transfer. I think this was the transfer. Yeah, this is pre-Caesar because 
This is before, when it was still a republic. Uh, anyway, still the people often expected bread distributions or unrest would ensue. Sanitation works were extensive, in particular in the biggest cities and the capital. The minor core law, corn law says a new law is voted in where the poor from your capital can buy bread at discounted price. As a side effect, this will attract the poor from neighboring regions, though. Your capital region will get a plus five loyalty for 15 turns and one extra citizen, but the law will cost some money for each citizen in capital and all surrounding ranges. Okay, that's not bad. You get an extra citizen and plus five loyalty, which I don't really care about the loyalty, honestly. It's weird, but we don't. Similar to the minor corn law, this is the major corn law now. Um, each such, re oh, this will, will allow all citizens of your capital province, not region, but province to buy bread at a discounted price. So each such region gets plus 15 loyalty, but the elite are displeased, 10% reduction in culture generation. Hmm. It doesn't seem to get you an extra citizen though, so I don't like it. Uh, there will be a low monetary cost to pay for each citizen of the province, yeah. It's actually less than paying for it of the region. Huh. New health regulations. Uh, there's one of them. I think it's sanitation works, which is amazing. But regulations are promulgated so that fresh water access is improved in your nation. Each region with at least one health building will get a plus 5% health bonus for 20 turns. Unfortunately, we're so early on, a lot of our places don't have health buildings. Last one, extent, uh, sanitation works. Extensive works are launched so that fresh water access is more reliable and widespread. Aqueducts might be built. Sanitation networks extended. Each region of your nation with at least one, with at most one health building. Each region of your nation with at most one health building has a 5% chance per population to receive a new one. In this case, a minus 10% infrastructure penalty will be applied to the region during 10 turns. That's kind of interesting because a 10% drop, um, that's essentially saying is, is your infrastructure, can you build it in one turn? 10% for 10 turns is, you know, on average, it should be more or less 100% for one turn, right? Which means, is it worth it to build a sanitation building in one turn? I think so. Now, let's look at how many places have health buildings. One, two. Now, they have at most one, so everybody would qualify for the other one, which is why I'm probably going to do that. But the, the, there's other things we could do, like the minor cord law would give us this plus five loyalty bonus in the capital, which we, again, we don't need at all. But really what we what we would be paying is 135 to get an extra citizen, which has some pretty big benefits, I'd say. Now, unfortunately, we're coming up on 37 minutes and I haven't made a decision yet. Again, if you're like worried about the pacing of this, um, I'm worried about that if you aren't, even if you aren't. Uh, we'll go a lot faster once we're familiar with these laws. So this time, I think we'll go ahead with sanitation works. I would like that citizen, but let's let's go ahead and do it. We can also defer these decisions. And I can think about it off camera, but for now, we're okay with just doing that one. So next we have, okay, hemp in one turn and nothing else. Okay, so let's go. Let's go. Can we do two turns in a minute? Unlikely, very, very unlikely. I think the game itself will limit us. So we'll probably stop at turn 19. We'll try to get one more in a minute. Still not bad. I'll make it up for it in the next one. Again, we'll move faster. Okay, moving up in the world though. Number, number 38. So we're just getting further and further away from the aging tier, which I, I like. Usually that's how it goes. If you just don't do anything, if you aren't going and making your situation worse, other people usually are on average and you'll slowly get better. So we got our hemp field as, it, as we see. So we can actually get tier two, ah, we did not. So we can actually get tier two food buildings, which means that when I don't get those, I probably won't bother. Oh my gosh, charcoal. So we don't have lumber yet. Ah, a palisade might be necessary. I don't like slave markets and a theater, which is actually excellent. So this is a really tough decision between charcoal pile Herbalist is really good too. I'm gonna go with the theater for culture. It's gonna cost us some infrastructure. I really like Palisade by the way as well. It's so good, but theater just doesn't come up often enough and it's a great way to build culture. You know, we have two people working here. Those two people can do anything else once this theater is constructed. 
So in a way, what I can do is put them more into construction to speed it up because it's, you know, eh, that's just how it works, right? And we're over the 40 minute mark. I'm, I'm paying attention. <laughs> I'm trying to. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and try to advance to turn 20 now. Eke out another two turns quickly. So that decision's done. There was another thing. Clear water has been completed. Oh, okay, good. So we got something for free. It's already paying off, which means minus 5% infrastructure penalty. It's only 5%. Huh. So probably we'll start dropping our infrastructure in general. Uh, we'll drop it here, but we'll keep it high other places because they are not having the same effect. And Religious Troubles is gone in one turn, so that's going to be great. So fantastic. So we're getting a little bit of, we're getting free health buildings. That's popping. Obviously, it's great. Okay, moving on. We'll see what that um, little drop in culture does for our CDR, culture decadence ratio which is how, by the way, the big list is determined by your CDR. Which uh, the abbreviation immediately reminds me of CCR, clear, <laughs> clearance, Credence Clearwater Revival. So we dropped three positions. That's not too bad. We're still far enough away-ish that I'm, I'm okay with our position. Like I said, even if we don't do anything from here, we should s stabilize and maybe even start moving up again. Since again, people just, it's all about fighting against the increasing decadence. In general, it's a constant increase in decadence. Nothing really to do here, so I actually think we can swing another, oh. Oh, what? They pillaged. This is really unfortunate. Okay, Colchis, you've now made yourself an enemy of me. I don't think, can we raid? Oh, we can? Okay, well, let's raid. So Colchis essentially raided us, which means now, now we're gonna have this stupid raided modifier. Just when things were starting to get better. <laughs> poor Calibia is just never, nothing ever works out for her. <laughs> this poor region. Anyway, I didn't know that we could raid and now that Colchis has raided us, we're going full bore against her. In fact, we have a huge amount of money and probably there's already been comments to this effect, but I think it's finally time for us to start building a navy. So I think it's time for us to build some pirate ships, and then we can start raiding the Colchis people. We can raid the Paphlagonians. How many is enough? Um, these have a maintenance upkeep of five each. We're at plus 40. Let's just give ourselves a little bit of a buffer. Let's say 30. So if, with that in mind, I can build six of them, which is exactly what I have queued up. We'll see how many, if that's enough to do anything or not. They, The other two neighbors might have even more ships than that. We'll find out. So I think we don't need to do anything else this turn, actually. So we can end the turn very quickly. And then I'll call the video to a close on turn 20, just as I was hoping. Ah, yep. They have eight ships, and we'll actually see what how many ships they have when we move our ships over there. So this is so weird, because although Paphlagonia, I'm trying to point my mouse like way over there, it shows their, yeah, so we actually dropped two more. That's a little disconcerting, but I'm going to try to avoid putting more people in culture until we get, we're going to have higher culture very soon, right? So this is weird. Although it shows the ships over here, the port for um, Paphlagonia, this is province itself, is in this tile. And I don't know where that shows that, but it's just a, a little bit of a mess. Anyway, we'll come back and look at all the different modifiers for the next turn in the next video. For now, thanks for watching, and until the next one, take care.